Your Royal Highness, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing in front of you this evening as a result of a half-century journey. It's a journey in which a passion has turned into a dream and then a dream has turned into re reality. The passion was one I developed as a schoolboy and it was for bravery. This grew partly from my general interest in events from the Second World War and more specifically because I had been inspired by my father, Eric Ashcroft. My late father was a modest man, but eventually with much prompting from his persistent son, he told me of his own terrifying experiences on June the 6th, 1944, uh, during the D-Day landings. He movingly recalled how he and other officers had been told to expect 75% casualties dead and wounded as they landed. My father's CO, a colonel, was in fact shot dead at his side shortly after arriving at Sword Beach. My father himself was wounded by shrapnel, but he fought on until he was eventually ordered from the battlefield. As a small boy, I sat wide-eyed as he painted a vivid picture of his small landing craft crashing through the waves towards Sword Beach, and as he conjured up the sense of fear, the metaphorical sense of fear, the physical smell of vomit, as he and his men approached the inevitable hail of machine gun fire that would welcome them as they raced towards the French soil. I felt a surge of pride that my father, Lieutenant Eric Ashcroft, had played such a courageous part in the war effort. And from that, my interest in bravery grew and grew. I became the schoolboy geek on Normandy, which led me to the Victoria Cross and the reading of those fantastic stories. And courage is a truly wonderful quality, yet it's extremely difficult to understand. You can't actually measure it. You certainly can't bottle it and you can't buy it. Yet those who display it are quite rightly looked up by others and are admired by society. Wiser and braver men than me have struggled to comprehend gallantry and what makes some individuals risk the greatest gift of all, life itself, for a comrade, the queen and country, or sometimes even for a complete stranger. And over the years, my passion for bravery in general transformed itself into one for gallantry medals in particular. And such medals are the tangible record of an individual's service and courage. And when I was in my early 20s, I hoped one day to own one Victoria Cross, the ultimate decoration for Britain and the Commonwealth for bravery in the face of the enemy. Yet I was a man of few means and the cost of such decorations was for me then prohibitive. So I hope that that explains the passion. But what was the dream that it turned into? And I will fast forward two decades until shortly after my 40th birthday. And by now I was fortunate enough to have made a little money as an entrepreneur. And so in July 1986, I bought at auction my first Victoria Cross. It was a decoration that had been awarded to leading seaman James McGuinness for valor during the last year of the Second World War in a midget sub that destroyed the Japanese cruiser Jakawa in the Straits of Yahoo of Singapore. And although I had initially intended the purchase to be a simple one-off, I quickly decided as I read the citation holding that one Victoria Cross in my hand, that a frisson went through me that perhaps can only be explained by a collector, that the end of what I thought would be the ambition was starting to be the start of another one. And that one VC became two. Soon the collection hit double figures and so on. And today that collection stands at 164 Victoria Crosses, one in eight of every one that was issued. And I recently purchased the first George Cross. And as my collection became the largest in the world, I wanted to bring the decorations to a wider audience. I felt somewhat uncomfortable and uneasy that a collection of such size should be just held for the enjoyment of the individual collector. 
I knew I wanted the decorations to be enjoyed by thousands and thousands of people, but the difficulty was how to achieve it. In short, the dream was to somehow get the collection on a show in a suitable location. But I was an international businessman, not a museum curator. And once again, I'll fast forward two decades, this time to the summer of 2008. And as a result of a great behind the scenes discussion, I was able to announce that not only had I agreed to a sizable donation so that the collection of VCs in the world would go on display in a new gallery. The location was what I considered to be not just a suitable location, but quite literally the best location for the VCs, this world-renowned Imperial War Museum. And over the past two and a half years, many, many people have worked around the clock to ensure that that dream became, and what you will all see this evening, in the gallery upstairs into a reality. And on this special evening, please just allow me to say a few public thank yous. And I'd like to thank Her Royal Highness for agreeing to open the gallery and gracing us with her presence this evening. I'd like to thank the staff of the Imperial War Museum and many others beside for their immense vision, their hard work, and their great dedication in being able to get the gallery built to standards in a time scale that were thoroughly demanding, to say the least. My gratitude also goes to the Victoria Cross and George Cross Association and its secretary, Didi Graham, who could not have done more to support this uh, project. I'd also like to thank the well over 20 living recipients of the VC and GC, who on Remembrance Day have been kind enough to come here this evening. For others, including Christina Schmidt, uh, who is also here tonight. Their formidable challenge, Christina's, has been to continue her life without the support of her husband. Staff Sergeant Olaf Oz Schmidt was awarded his decoration, sadly, posthumously. I'd also like to thank Michael Naxton, my medals consultant, whose experience and wise counsel enable me to get to 100 Victoria Crosses without anyone realizing that a single collector had put this together. In a year often dominated by bad news and difficult economic times, I'm delighted that so many journalists have embraced the merits of the gallery in such a positive way, and it is very unusual of me to have great gratitude to journalists. <laughs> And finally, I'd like to think, thank Angela Entwistle, my corporate communication director, who's worked tirelessly to enable this project to come to fruition. And I very much hope that my late father would have been proud of this gallery if he'd have been able to be here this evening. Uh, but in any case, Dad, this is partly for you. And the collection which is now cared for by the Imperial War Museum covers most of the campaigns in which the VC has been awarded over the past 154 years. And there are a number of hugely impressive individual stories. The collection encompasses the second ever Victoria Cross awarded to Lieutenant John Bythesey, the 20th century's first Victoria Cross to Private John Barry in South Africa in 1901, and the last VC of the 20th century to Sergeant Ian Mackay in the Falklands in 1982. The collection also covers the first aviation VC, a string of submarine awards, two of the five civilian VCs, and one of just three double VCs in the world. But as recently as last year, the collection took possession of the decorations of Captain Noel Chavas, a medical officer who earned a VC both on the Somme and at Ypres, thereby becoming the only man to receive a VC and bar during the Great War. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can now see why my 50-year journey means so much to me and why I'm so delighted that it is impossible to turn my passion into a dream and eventually that dream into a reality. The gallery is a reality that fills me with pride and joy because for many years to come, it will achieve precisely what I set out to do, to highlight and to champion the valor and gallantry 
of those men and women who deserve their place in history as the bravest of the brave. Thank you very much indeed for coming.